Okay, I think we can start. Um, welcome to my talk about infrastructure as code. Um, and uh, I'm really all, um, excited about this topic lately. Uh, so I will just uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I work at Showroom. Um, I think it's mostly known for uh, Polish people because we are uh, just in the Polish and German market. Uh, right now, we are trying to uh, go to expand to Europe, but uh, we are not so famous yet. Uh, I'm a PHP developer for, for a couple of years already, so from the starting uh, from PHP 3. So that's also why I'm here and why I want you to introduce a new topic, not so PHP related, but more DevOps stuff. Uh, so I would call myself a, a DevOps enthusiast because uh, being CTO is like you have to wear a couple of hats and uh, right now I'm doing a bit of DevOps, uh, sometimes I'm doing development. So I will start with a big um, component. So do you have an idea what these uh, six lines of code will do? Okay, so basically they will um, build you an entire infrastructure, which is uh, a cloud infrastructure. Uh, this will create uh, 52 components, resources also called, uh, which includes um, a network, uh, which is here called the VPC, uh, so a virtual private cloud. Uh, with subnets, it's uh, a lot of uh, DevOps and um, a network related, so you have like classes, uh, net gateways, uh, internet gateways, and all this stuff. Uh, most of the time you don't even know they exist. Um, they, this will also create uh, a bastion, which is um, a, small SS, uh, a small Linux box. You can just log in and then access the internal network, so the kind of concept like you have with a VPN, so you can connect. Um, just not to expose all the ports uh, outside. Um, and it's also called a jump host, if you want. Um, it will also has like um, ECS, which is, uh, this example is Amazon stuff, so it is a container registry. Uh, you can deploy Docker and this kind of stuff. Um, and within an instance, you will have uh, a base Ubuntu image, and on top of that, uh, Docker services uh, you can um, deploy on them. An example is uh, here, uh, where you, uh, you can have uh, a lot of Nginxes, a database, a site, an OAuth um, service, uh, so microservice-oriented uh, stuff here. And just with this six lines of code. But uh, during the presentation, I will show you how to get there, because you have to understand what it's doing underneath. So. But I will also start with uh, the history, not, not the whole history, but a brief overview over um, how we get there. So how is it even possible that we can, just with six lines of code, build an infrastructure? So um, basically, uh, not so long ago, if you wanted to um, have an application hosted uh, on the internet, you had to buy a server and put the application there. Uh, so um, you, built, uh, you bought one server for one application, or if your application was bigger than a couple of servers for a single application, but it was like the system, and on top of that was some servers. Um, then if you wanted another application, for example, um, a, different, um, a different application or two connected with each other, you still have to buy another server and connect them um, in the data center, and so on. So um, you had to buy three or, or even more. And uh, back up the days, you had um, uh, the big companies uh, started building their data centers internally. So every big company like Dell, uh, they also make servers. But let's say um, Microsoft uh, had to build their own data centers to host these, um, these services. And um, it was very common that you had to buy a big box with, back then, for example, 4 gigs of RAM. Uh, but you only needed, I don't know, 100 megs because you had to over-provision because you don't know how the tra traffic will be, um, and it, it was uh, very time-consuming. Um, later, of course, we had uh, collocation, so the company started to uh, build uh, the data centers and then bringing also other people in to give their 
uh, access to internet, um, power, and so on. Um, and we as the customers uh, started also to leverage uh, new technology, which is, for example, virtual machines. So you can um, have separate applications, for example, Linux and Microsoft, uh, so Windows stuff or any other stuff on the same physical hardware, uh, so you can better uh, allocate the resources and make use of all the power the server has. Um, and later also, of course, containers, which is now the buzzword, um, so we can even, even better on, on a single system uh, have um, a lot of services. Um, last but not least, uh, a lot of um, services you back in the days were uh, doing yourself, uh, for example, DNS or CDN. I don't think anybody is doing it right now, so you use an external DNS provider, uh, nobody does that anymore, and if you want to um, have a lot of media, you also use a CDN network and don't build it on your own because um, it's a lot of money and it doesn't make sense. So uh, you started using uh, our source companies. So to summarize uh, this movement, we have like infrastructure as a service, uh, which is, for example, AWS or Google Cloud, and there are many of them, um, which is uh, just giving you some resources you can use, uh, which is most of the time CPU, disk, and the basic stuff, uh, network. Then you have um, platform as a service, which is more like uh, Google App Engine, for example, where you give your application and they take care of um, combining it with a database and uh, running it. You don't care about configuration. Um, like you do with uh, infrastructure as a service. And then you have, of course, uh, software as a service, which is like the end-to-end -end solution, for example, G Suite, which is also known as uh, Google Apps, or any other cloud-based, most of the stuff, for example, GitHub. Um, so going back to the process of um, taking care of your servers, you have like four steps. First, you had to acquire your server. Uh, which is done by the vendor. So you call Dell, for example, or a retail, uh, reseller, and say, okay, I want this and this machine, Place, make me an offer. Uh, then you go to the financial department, they pay the bill, uh, and then they have to ship it to you. Um, yeah, and then the next part. So you have a data center ops, so people that take care of the machines, of the physical stuff, and they have to um, most of the time test if the setup is really what I have ordered or if it works well, then I have to ship it to my data center or collocation space, uh, put it in the rack uh, to the wiring and all this stuff and install of course um, some uh, operating system and packages. Then you have um, a sysadmin which is uh, responsible for updates and the maintenance of the server, sometimes also DC ops because a disk fails so you have to replace it. Um, so fixing hardware also, but also um, taking care of the software. And after years or sometimes months, you want to destroy it. The server can be outdated or has low performance, or you just um, change the, um, the application which is running on top of them, so you give it to another department or another team in your, in your company. So. Um, yeah, this is also DC ops. Acquiring a server, just like a plain uh, physical server, takes weeks, uh, sometimes months, because you have to make an offer. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge process, and it also has to be t um, taken care of in advance. For example, you can't just, uh, you have a Black Friday um, e uh, event, so you have to prepare in advance for this. Uh, provisioning takes um, at least days, because you have to physically go to the data center, test everything. You can't just uh, put it, plug it in and say, okay, let's uh, put some uh, production traffic on it. And then updating takes also days uh, in the way of fixing uh, physical stuff, uh, for example, disk that fails, or also like maintaining um, the system. And destroying, I would also say it's um, more like in days. So with cloud computing, um, this is all gone, so we still have the process here, but now the acquiring is a matter of seconds because you just have to pick your configuration and then tell it, tell the um, the company which is which you are hosting hosted on. For example, AWS, uh, I want that machine uh, with this kind of uh, CPU and RAM, and uh, click a button or make an API call, and that's it. Uh, provisioning is like picking the distro, so you just from the select say, okay, I want Ubuntu, 
Um, updating is nowadays done with Chef or any other tooling, so also seconds. And destroying it is also a terminate call to the API or a click of a button. So things got more uh, a way easier, but there are a couple of questions still. So how do I provision the resources? You can, of course, do the clicking if you were just playing around. Um, how do you manage resource life cycles? So um, destroying it, um, acquiring it again, and so on. Um, then you have a couple of providers. So how do I balance service providers providing core technology for my data center? And um, how do I enforce policy across all these resources? So they are the same or, uh, or, or not. Um, and then basically, how do I automate this? So if we have a lot of them and we do this uh, tiny configuration with uh, containers and so on, so how do I accomplish that? And uh, of course you do it with a tool and that tool can be Terraform. Um, Terraform is a tool made, uh, is an open source tool, so you don't have to pay for it. It's, um, it's written in Go, um, and it's made by HashiCorp. Um, who knows about HashiCorp? Good, uh, the rest will, uh, because they make Vagrant. Who knows Vagrant? Yeah, so that's the company behind uh, Terraform also. They make also um, other stuff, uh, like from the Linux philosophy, like one, tool um, that makes the job uh, extremely well, and Terraform is one of them. They have Regrant and other tools also there. So the goal of, um, and this is a bit like they are um, marketing it, it's, um, it's a tool. So the goal from Terraform is to, uh, that it's a tool to provide a single workflow, um, which has a unified view. Um, and of course, like the topic of the um, um, of this talk uh, using infrastructure as code um, that can be iterated and changed safely and is capable of complex entire applications. So not just a startup or a single application, a blog, but also like big stuff. So for any of you. But you're looking what is all about. So let's get into the code, which is, I think, um, better for programmers to reason about. So. Here's a simple example of using infrastructure as code, and the, it's a single text file uh, written in, an, um, in that format. I will cover a bit later um, how it's built. But um, we have two resources you can see on the indentions here. Um, the first resource is um, DigitalOcean droplets. So DigitalOcean is one of the cloud providers. You have AWS, Google, and DigitalOcean, for example. A droplet is a VPC, which is they call a droplet. So that's why it's so called. Demo is, also, of course, what I name it. And then I have uh, only four required um, attributes. I have to pick a distro, so I pick Ubuntu. I have to name it, so it will d uh, appear in the panel. Uh, it's PHP CE, for example. I have to pick a region because all most of the cloud providers have a couple of regions. So this is Frankfurt, the, the closest one for Poland. And I have to pick a size. So I just pick the lowest one uh, because it's the cheapest. If you are playing around, uh, just keep with the lowest ones just to not to pay too much. Um, and then I want to, um, when I have that uh, instance, I'm not that good at memorizing things, so I want to have a DNS record that says that's my server dot my company dot com. So I make a Cloudflare record, and Cloudflare, on the other hand, is a, another provider which is doing DNS. Uh, you can use uh, then a simple uh, root 53 from Amazon, or there are a lot of DNS providers out there. Um, but this is just an example. So I again um, have to. Um, Describe some uh, attributes I want to I want to address. So I pick a domain. This is my domain. Um, I pick um, the the name of the record. So, so the um, the string before the uh, the dot. Um, it is an A record because I will pointing to an AP address. And I pick the value. And the first thing you can see from because it was until now it was only text. It doesn't make it, it's not a programming language or anything like that. But then in the value of the Cloudflare rec record, you can see there are some variables, and they are. Uh, so I can use uh, um, a, vari uh, a value from the previous resource and put it into the next one. So I will put in the IP I don't know in advance, because cloud providers don't give you IP addresses in advance. 
they give you them when you run the instance. So, how do I file this up? There is uh, Terraform, it's a, as I said, it's a single binary with Go, so you can just download it on the website, or use your package manager, it's very um, convenient and simple. Um, so I first have to make an init call, which will be downloading the providers I will be using. And it's a one-time action, uh, if you add a provider, you have to uh, do it again, but most of the time it's just to get, get started, like git init. So it's the same here. So it will download uh, the provider plugins. Then, not so readable, I think, but it's not so important to get every line here. Um, what it does is a Terraform plan. So the plan is here critical. Um, it would just tell me it's a dry run, like with Composer, you can do, uh, oh, Composer, I don't have it. Do they have a dry run in Composer? Yeah, okay. Uh, but you know what I mean. So you just tell what, will, uh, what are you planning to do, so without um, doing the stuff. So it will just tell you, okay, I will create two resources, and it's uh, a summary um, at the bottom. It will add this instance I, will be, uh, I want to have and an, a DNS record. And um, the critical part here, uh, because of this tool, is first of all, it uses two providers, and I don't have to know the API of, that, of these providers. And then it also knows that because I don't know the IP address in advance, I first have to create the instance and then have to, uh, and ha then have to create the DNS record. Even if I change the, um, the, the script uh, on the first screen, so this one, even if cloud for record was the first uh, thing in the file, it still would know um, the instance has to be created first. So this is our plan. And then there is another function, apply, which will be creating the resources. And that's it. Um, it took here uh, 26 seconds to create, and it's all the timing um, that DigitalOcean needs to run an instance. So basically, uh, you have to wait for the um, longest run and task to finish or the dependencies to accomplish uh, all, the, um, all the stuff. And um, I hope you will be starting playing with it. So. One, um, another important comment is destroy. So if you just finished um, the instance, you can connect it, but then you, have, uh, you want to go um, and uh, do your uh, real stuff, um, then you can just destroy the, um, the sandbox you, will, uh, you were working on. And all the resources will be uh, deleted. So you don't, you're not built anymore. And with most of the cloud providers, for example, Google is building like per minute, um, I think AWS um, since a month also. Um, so most of the time it's like a couple of cents, so it's not so expensive. But be aware that you, ha you will be built for this. Uh, um, you have to make a free tire if you don't want to. Okay, so next step, because we have this acquiring and, and provisioning part covered, but what when I want to replace something? Of course, I'm not talking about replacing hardware because that's why you're using the cloud and you don't have to care about this. So it will be done by the provider. But you want to, you change your mind because you want a big instance, for example. So this is what the code is about. And I showed you a diff so the text file doesn't look like that exactly because it's more like a git diff. Um, and that's the whole idea of infrastructure's code, that you can reason about it looking at code and at differences in the code. So I think it's clear when you get familiar with the previous slide that now I just want to change a single value and I want to uh, have a gig of RAM and nothing else should change. So always run then the plan function. So you have, you like, it's basically like covering a PHP with tests so you know what I've just written is what I wanted to accomplish. So it's the plan. Um, so it will tell you. I will make an update in place, um, which means the resource will still be there, but I will just make, um, make um, an upgrade with RAM. And here it depends which provider you are using, because, for example, DigitalOcean can't make um, upgrades of the machine without um, um, a short um, downtime. So it has to shut down the machine, then upgrade it and um, put it back online. So you uh, probably have to have a couple of machines uh, behind a load balancer and take that instance off. But um, still, it's far, um, it's uh, way faster 
then recreating it from scratch and you don't lose the data on the disk. So it tells you that. So it's an update in place and it's saying only this attribute will change, so the 50, um, 100 max to one gig. Uh, and again, a summary, nothing to add, one change, nothing to destroy, because you can do a lot of stuff um, in the same, at the same time. Then you hit apply, so do it, uh, and it took uh, 43 seconds, so you see it's quite a long time, because 26 seconds was to create an instance, and now it's like double, so it looks like uh, the shutdown and the the booting takes some time, um, but still from your perspective it was a single line of change, uh, of code change, and it took uh, seconds, not uh, weeks or anything like that. Um, so let's take another example. Uh, let's say we want to pick another distro. And again it all depends uh, which resource you are using or which provider you're using, but um, changing the distro uh, means you have to create a new instance. You can't just have a Linux instance and say, okay, I want to have Windows. So what should I do with Windows with the files on the disk? It doesn't make sense. So, but um, again, the plan function will tell you that. So here you hit plan uh, and it will say, okay, I have to recreate that resource because of the image change and it's red here um, because the, um, the boot uh, ISO will change. And because the, the instance has to be recreated and um, DigitalOcean gi doesn't give you IP addresses um, you can um, keep on your account, it will look at, give you them dynamically, uh, you will get a new IP address. So Terraform knows, okay, so then I have also to update the DNS record because that changed. So it, it keeps track of all the dependencies between uh, the resources you, you have. And again, hit apply. Um, and it will destroy the, um, the instance, uh, create a new one, and uh, make the change on the DNS uh, server. And this also took like uh, a minute. So the format, um, which is, um, you, you have two ways. You can use the TF format, which is kind of, um, I don't know, it's a, it's, um, it's a custom build syntax, but it's kind of uh, simple text file, so it's human-friendly configuration. But then underneath, it's, um, it's JSON compatible, so for machines, they can use JSON. You can use also JSON, but I highly recommend uh, the format uh, on the slides because uh, you can add comments, which you can't uh, with JSON. And you can also add uh, commas at the end, so adding a single file will always show a green git add line on not the uh, delete and plus minus pl plus minus plus one. So it's uh, cool to make code reviews. So it is VCS uh, friendly format. So for version control, for Git, SVN, uh, whatever you use. And so it's also like uh, you should review the code. You should do pull requests. It's like um, not um, bringing all the stuff to your team, also to developers. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do at my company. Right, guys? <laughs> Uh, and to review the, uh, the code, even if, for example, for now, uh, not everybody will know, will know all the details, but they can reason about it. Do we need that instance or how does it work? So it's all written down. And you know who made the change and when. So it's also cool. And then basically you have the entire infrastructure's code, uh, which is uh, good because you have history, you have backups, you can recreate it from scratch. Uh, and I will show you also it's uh, very, uh, it's like uh, a single command to make an exact copy of your infrastructure, just naming it, for example, staging and firing it up. So you have, you can have um, so many environments uh, as you wish. And from a pers uh, provider perspective, I just showed you DigitalOcean and Cloudflare, but you have already over 70 providers, uh, 72 uh, for the time being, uh, as far as I remember, and they are um, added every single day. Uh, new providers, you can also um, plug um, your own provider in, so for example, your own API or something, because uh, basically Terraform can uh, manage everything that has an API. So it's like a tool for API management and resources, and most of um, the providers have excellent, um, excellent plugins. And these plugins are not um, in the tool itself. They are 
just dependencies which are downloaded. And they are most of the time maintained by the company making, uh, making uh, the servers. So, for example, the AWS provider is um, developed by AWS uh, employees. And the same goes for uh, New Relic, Datadog, DigitalOcean, and so on. So they are very up to date and very good covered in their um, API and uh, philosophy of uh, doing a business because they know if it's easier for you to get on, on board of the service, uh, it's a win for them because you pay them. But let's take a simple solution because I guess not, all, not everybody of you will be um, managing the infrastructure at your company. So you can use the tool also for not infrastructure stuff because it's all like the uh, software as a service stuff. For example, you use GitHub and you want to, you are a team manager at your company or a developer, it doesn't matter, and uh, you want to add a new team member, uh, so you go to the GitHub page and ask the person what's your GitHub login and I will add it on the website, but you can write it down in code. So here's an example, I have a team, uh, we have a backend team for example, so it's run resource, and it will be created here if it doesn't exist, and then I say I will add myself uh, or a future employee um, to the team. And um, it, it will be managed with Terraform and it will be versioned. I will know who, does the, uh, who did that change and when. And again, just hit the plan. You will see it's new, uh, a new team is created. Uh, I will later also show a comment that allows you to use existing stuff. So you don't have to uh, delete everything you have. So you can uh, start from where you are. Um, and apply, of course. And um, with it's not infrastructure for real, so it's software. So it takes two seconds to do this from a tool perspective. So it's very, uh, very fast uh, and um, scalable. So you can add a lot of them. You can make um, uh, arrays uh, of developers and all the dependencies will also uh, be recognized by the tool. So I can also make, for example, a GitHub repository uh, just to show you there are endless uh, possibilities uh, to uh, to give you s just some ideas what you can do with the tool. Simple syntax, four lines of code, uh, nothing uh, complicated here. The description is optional, I think, so even three lines of code. And you have a repository. Uh, it's private by default, but it's uh, you can all check these attributes. And there are, of course, for this uh, resource, there are like 20 attributes you can um, set up, for example, branch protection or uh, if it's private or public and all this stuff, but uh, they are optional. So plan, apply. Uh, again, one second. Um, so to show you, because we are at a PHP conference, so I will, I want to um, show you at uh, this at a PHP tool, which is PHP Storm, to um, make you even. Uh, make it even more um, more addressed to you so you can use it uh, on your own. And I have prepared some syntax not to be, um, not to write it all from scratch, but I will add something here. So first of all, I will cover this because it's quite complex. And I chose this example because uh, it is complex and you just have to um, know that you can add something very simply and don't, uh, don't bothering about what, what's in there. So um, I, I'm using here um, all the native resources that are available with the AWS provider and I will create an AWS instance. But uh, I will also create uh, a network which is required. AWS gives you default uh, networks but I don't recommend uh, using them when you create um, stuff with uh, code, because then you will share, uh, the, for example, the network when you are in a different environment. For example, you won't do the staging and production testing. And if you don't override that I will want, I want to use my own uh, network, then they will use the default one and they are uh, just the same. So um, always use um, your custom uh, network and the way of making sure you are, just delete the default one and then it will get you an error. Sorry, I can't use the default because you have deleted it. You can al always recreate it. So the first uh, thing, very simple, an, a network. I have to just give an address um, uh, with the range of IPs, I, IP addresses I want to use. 
This is um, the biggest mask you can do on AWS, so it's 65,000 uh, addresses, but why not? Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Then uh, we have special resources that are data resources, so I'm not creating things. I just want to get some info from the provider, which is a data provider. Uh, and I'm asking um, AWS, um, sorry, how many regions do you have? Because if you are in Frankfurt, they have, for example, three. In London, they have three. But in America, they have five. So five data centers that are physically separated. So just don't, to don't disturb if one goes down. Uh, but they are very good connected with each other. So you can just uh, treat it as they are in the same network. But then um, you have the high availability you are searching for. And I think most of the time, that's the reason why you are moving to the cloud. So this is the resource. Next is subnet, because I just have um, um, a network uh, up there uh, with, an, uh, with an address, but I have to split it into the regions. The regions. So I say, um, first I say I want as many, I, I create so much subnets, as many um, available regions I have. So this will automatically, if I have three regions there, it will create three subnets. If I have five, I will take uh, um, advantage of all of them. Just a subnet, is, you, don't, you don't pay for it. It's just making sure you can later expand because some services like Elasticsearch or console or these kind of network stuff, um, so these, um, 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 these programs that are made for uh, distribution, uh, they like the most uh, reason. The, the most regions, the better. So this will be handled automatically. Then I um, make a cut of the network I have. Uh, so this is a special function. Uh, I won't cover all the functions. There are a lot of them. Uh, but you have them available so we can do some stuff, uh, computation stuff, uh, or mathematical. So I will just uh, cut the network into pieces and then use the index, um, like the index counter, to pick one of them. Uh, I will assign a public IP for every instance I will be creating in that VPC, and I bind the second resource with the first one. So I just tell the VPC is from here. And I will show you um, um, at the bottom um, how this is handled also in PHP Um To go very quick uh, through the other resources, it's an internet gateway I have to have, so I have to, uh, s uh, without it, I can't go outside of, uh, of the network, so I have internet access. And I also have to make, um, I need um, to know what's the root table it's again very network stuff, but um, it's um, it's a single line, so you, it's not so complicated. I just have to have the variable here and the root table. So um, this basically means that everything um, within that IP range I have above uh, will be hitting the internet. Then I, as I mentioned earlier, I want to create an instance. So my goal for this um, 70, and when I finish, it will be 100 lines of code. Uh, is to have an, um, uh, an SSA, uh, a server which can, I can SSH to. Um, so I want to use Ubuntu. And of course, um, the, there are all these marketplaces uh, on the cloud providers, so I can um, pick the official canonical Ubuntu image for AWS. If you are using um, another provider, you have to just know um, whether, where, what's the naming of their resources and how, which, which values to put in there. So this data resource is um, good because I don't have to hard code this image and the ID of the image. Uh, so it will always get me the latest uh, Ubuntu 60 um, as LTS um, release of Ubuntu and it's always the official one. And there are uh, many times uh, bug fixes reported. So every time I will recreate it, I will get the, the best. Um, then I uh, use my GitHub account. Uh, I don't know if you uh, if you are aware of that. That uh, if you are um, on GitHub and you put your um, SSH keys there, um, you c everybody can see your public key, and that's what I'm uh, using here. So every user uh, can be mm, you can ask for the public key of every user on GitHub, um, and I'm just uh, using mine. So I don't have to hard code it here. And it's also convenient that if I change uh, my, my private key, so my keys, uh, and let's say I'm not uh, the guy doing uh, this configuration, uh, next time somebody fires up and knows uh, I, sh I should have access, 
he will be using my latest key, so it will always work. Um, I'm creating, I'm copying the key basically to AWS in the next resource, so it's the line uh, highlighted here. Can you see the highlighting? Okay. Um, and the last one, uh, before I add something, is a security group. So it's basically uh, a host that IP, IP tables, so I know where to put, uh, where I have to open ports. So by default, everything is closed. You can't access anything, uh, which is a good practice. So I have to say, okay, for that VPC, I make a policy that uh, all incoming requests on port uh, 22, which is default for HH, uh, SSH, uh, from all IP addresses, so I'm not, you can limit it to your uh, company network or your current IP, um, are allowed, nothing else. And outbound traffic, of course, is controlled by me, so uh, I can use anything. But I don't have the instance yet. I can, of course, run plan. And uh, you see here uh, some um, add-ons from the PHP Storm um, uh, IDE. So I can, for example, run the plan and apply functions directly from PHP Storm. And they are shortcuts just to create or plan this specific resource. So not the whole file. I can test it on a single piece of code um, to make it more specific. It's called a target. So I can target uh, any resource I have. So let's create the resource. and. Is it big enough, or should I do it a bit bigger? Okay, I do it a bit bigger. If, it's, if it doesn't fit, I will just make it smaller then. So, as you can see, there is auto completion for uh, within um, within um, the the tool. So it will also tell me which providers I already have downloaded. I'm also using some Rabbit stuff and so on. So it's all here. Uh, I will use an AWS instance, and it also tells me directly that there are two uh, required uh, arguments. I will use even more, but uh, it's kind of obvious. If I don't, it will tell me that there's an error. So I call it again demo. I can put anything uh, you want in there. And the AMI, so it's uh, the image I want to use. So I want to make use of the Ubuntu image I have um, selected um, above. So. I will use a dollar sign, and that should be familiar for you as PHP developers. Um, then, a bit um, different than in PHP, I have to use curly brackets and uh, address that resource. So it was a data resource because it's not something I've created. Uh, then it's an AWS AMI. Uh, it's like you see, I just press uh, tab and enter. <laughs> so it's not very complicated. Uh, ID, and I'm ready for the for the image. Uh, then I can also ask for instance types. That's what the pricing is about. So uh, a small instance, a big instance. Uh, so you, uh, I will just hard code it here. But you can also make filters and ask for the uh, for the lowest priced resource or the biggest or choose random if you want. Uh, so that's the cheapest one. And for uh, for playing around, I re recommend using it. Uh, then. Um, AWS uh, requires you to um, to make an instance available with your public key. They don't allow passwords. They don't do this from security reasons. So they will try. Uh, this um, variable was um, optional. So they will try to use your default key. Uh, key. But I, as I said, um, it's a bad practice because then you have dependency um, yeah, issues, basically, because in, in in two different environments, you can delete um, the, the default key or something. So it's not recommended. So ag again, I will use uh, a variable which I created uh, above. So it's uh, a pair name. It was named Sebastian. It's good to uh, name things properly so you keep track of them and you know what this resource is about. And uh, stick with your names because if you change them, uh, Terraform has to basically recreate the resource because it thinks it's a different resource. So that's not so good, but keep in mind. Again, ID. Um, then I want to, um, I can make, um, I have to pick a region. So my, my, my network as a whole can live uh, above all the regions. That makes sense because I want to have them internally like a single network. But if I pick a physical instance, it has to live somewhere. So I just pick uh, the first subnet. So I have to pick something here. Um, and I will just um, say, okay, I have the subnets, I have the demo, and there are so many, as many regions I have, so I just say, okay, it's uh, easier, I 
just want the first one. And uh, with AWS, it's also important that you have, for example, this naming ABC. They call it ABC. And it's not like it's physical. The A is A for everybody in the room because it's random for everybody. So my A region can be your C region. So it doesn't matter. So just stick with the naming. And I recommend going from 0 to whatever index you need. So this was a subnet. And the last part of this is um, allowing um, to enter the instance. So I have to the security group, which is uh, still on the screen, uh, partly. Uh, I want to attach it to the instance so I can um, show you that I can log in. So security group, uh, which was called also demo and has an idea. Uh, I can add more security groups to a single instance. That's why it's a list. And to make things even more uh, developer friendly, I will output something on the console. So I will name it, I, I name it just SSH, so it will give me back some string. And I know that the Ubuntu image is using the Ubuntu uh, username by default. And then again, I will use a variable here. So I want to have my instance demo public IP. Done. OK. So I hope this will work. Yes, uh, I have the single file here. It's main TF. Uh, so, turn for a minute. It's the first time I'm doing this, so uh, we, we have to wait a couple of seconds. Done. Um, so I have uh, the providers. You can see uh, there is a special uh, folder uh, which with the providers uh, as plugins. And then always use a plan. Should I put it above? No, even worse. OK, but I just hit plan. So tell me what you're trying to do. And it will grab right now the um, GitHub uh, user key. We'll check um, if, uh, if it's available. And yeah, of course, there are no errors. And it, will, uh, it is planning to create nine resources uh, here. So going uh, just briefly, first, this is a data resource. So it just um, asks um, AWS about the root table. Then the instance itself. And most of the stuff, so the AMI, the image, was computed. But it's in there because I could uh, paste it manually. The rest of the stuff is computed because I don't know the instance state. I don't know the IP address in advance, um, none of this. Uh, and the defaults are also filled out. Then I have the internet gateway, which will be created, uh, which I also talked about. As you can see, my public key is uh, just um, just here. So it's I could have um, uh, pasted directly into the code. Uh, it, it doesn't matter for Terraform. Where, where it comes from. Uh, so root table, security group, and my subnets. So in the Frankfurt re region where I am um, deploying this, there are three regions, so it will create a subnet in each of them. And finally, uh, the network itself. And let's see how fast this goes. So turn from apply. And keep your fingers crossed, because live demos like to make some stupid jokes. And I'm running from my phone uh, hotspot, so it should take about uh, 30 seconds um, to create. And the timing, uh, of course, depends uh, on the provider itself. If you pick an instance, I think the biggest is one terabyte of RAM. Uh, I think it, it, it takes a bit more time. Uh, I don't know if somebody manually is clicking OK. This guy is. Uh, OK, so it finished, uh, it finished in uh, 18 seconds. So a uh, nice surprise from Amazon. Thank you. Uh, and it created all the resources um, as, I, as I wished to. And it outputted my custom variable, which I can now copy paste and hopefully connect to the instance. And it works. Wow. Uh, so I now have an Ubuntu uh, SSH server. I can ping our conference website, and it works. Cool. So this was, uh, oh no, before destroying it, because remember always when you play around to destroy it, because it will cost you money, uh, or make uh, attach a credit card which, don't have, uh, which has a limit on it. 
so if you forget to uh, that you can't be built uh, too much. Um, so I will briefly uh, show you a couple of comments. I think I have time only for one. <laughs> So Terraform has a couple of them. I will uh, show you some of them, just the description. But for example, we can use the Terraform console, uh, which is cool for um, just playing around to what you can do, for example, with functions. So what will return uh, splitting a subnet into four, for example? What will that output? So you don't have to write into the code. You just can play around. For example, I want to know uh, my instance. It was called demo. And the public IP I've used in the output, it should tell me, OK, it's that. Okay, so tell me what's the instance uh, state, for example. Oh, it's running. Cool. And so on. So you can just uh, ask uh, the provider uh, what, is, uh, what the resource states are. Um, so this is one of them. Um, and of course, the very um, important uh, destroyer. And it will also take some time. And uh, the de destroyer is basically when you create, uh, I have just created my infrastructure from scratch. And it has the dependencies, so it knows it has to create the network first. So just destroy is the opposite. So it has to uh, delete the instance, then all the stuff, and at the end, as you can see, uh, the network itself, because it doesn't make sense to destroy the network um, before the instance, uh, because you can get into a situation, and I had myself, that, for example, I first deleted um, my security group, so it cut me off from SSH access, and then I had resources, for example, please um, put a file on the server, and then it wanted to delete the file and says you don't have access to the server anymore. So you have to, uh, most of the time Terraform will know about that, but not always. So I just hit yes. You can use minus force to not type the yes here, uh, and we will delete the, the stuff just to show you that it really works and it's not only slides. OK, still destroying. Um, the instance uh, takes the most of the time, but yeah, it's still destroying. It will also, if it takes a lot of time, it will uh, repeatedly say, OK, I'm still trying, I'm still trying, I'm still trying, like every 10 seconds. Because some of the resources, uh, especially the host stuff, for example, you can have Redis as a service, you don't have to provision yourself. Um, they can take um, minutes or a, an hour to provision, so you have to wait a long time. Sometimes it depends on the provider, of course. Yeah, so still destroying. <laughs> okay, done. So all worked, and we are done. As I don't see a summary of this, but it took like a minute or something. Okay, so I would try to. Um, Get back to my slides. So this was the demo. This was the fallback if the internet sucks. Um, and I've already showed you the console. So you have a console you can play around uh, with. Uh, you have a format. It's FMT, which will uh, format your code with, with the best practices. It's very handful to just uh, it makes sure all the, um, all the variables are in place and so on. Um, so it basically rewrites config files to canon canonical, canonical format. Um, you have a graph comment. Uh, this will output graphs in a in dot format, so it's uh, it's a standard. And then you can use another tool to uh, make a graph out of it. For example, this kind of graph. This is the graph for the DigitalOcean plus DNS record. So you see the dependencies between them. You have the import, which I talked about earlier. So you uh, can, for example, you have GitHub teams. You can import them because you want, don't want to recreate them. So you just tell, OK, I have, you, have to, you still have to write the code like you would create it from scratch. It's not yet uh, magic uh, imports that will be placed in your code. But um, it will not try to create it, but just take the state as it is on GitHub, for example. So you just pass the. Uh, name of uh, of the resource and the ID uh, um, on GitHub's um, end. You have the output, which we used uh, for outputting stuff. You can use the variables. Uh, a very cool um, command is state. Sometimes you will run into issues. For example, like I said, with the security group, where I just uh, cut me out from SSH access, and I wanted to destroy everything, and it crept. So you can go to the panel, do it manually, and say, OK, I've already taken care of this. So please skip it, for example, with the remove. Okay, you can list your resources. 
or you can move them and all this stuff. So coming back to my example from the beginning, um, with all the code you will be writing in this format, you can, of course, um, share it within your company. You can make it open source. You can uh, get snippets from companies that, that, that are using Terraform. And there are, is already a lot uh, available on the internet. Um, there are books written um, on, on the topic. Uh, I've bought uh, this book earlier this year. And this is so progressing that when it came out and it was like uh, pre-release, it was already outdated when it comes to my, my home. So um, these kind of things, this is a snippet from uh, directly from GitHub.com. It's Segment. Segment is like a, a provider for uh, analytics stuff and they just give you a model you can use. So where you can find more info, of course the Terraform website where you can download Terraform. Um, they have a great documentation which is um, each provider is embedded in there so these are, these are just Git uh, links to um, up-to-date uh, documentation so this is also good. You can of course go to the readme files directly on GitHub and you have um, a registry where you can use, um, where you can search for, uh, you have the plain resources available which I just used at the, um, in, in my code, but you can also make use of like bundles uh, from um, best practices like how should you split your network or how should the network size be or uh, how should all this be done. And this is all like um, libraries, like in PHP you have the Symfony framework, so the registry is something you get which is doing the hard stuff uh, underneath so you don't have to care about this. So this is a uh, registry, but there are also things that are not uh, in that registry, so you have to just uh, browse Stack Overflow. Fortunately, Terraform is like a unique name, so it's not hard to search for it. Uh, like for Go, for example, it's harder. Let's say, find me something with Go. Um, so just search the internet for some uh, Stack Overflow or something like this. So we have time for a couple of questions. And this is the last talk of the conference, so take the chance and ask them. <laughs> so I won't be... <laughs> try. You want that? I'm not good at throwing, so... <laughs> yeah. It's not on the camera, so <laughs> let's yeah. pretend it works. Okay, is it working? Okay. <laughs> I've got two questions. Yeah. One of them is, sorry, how and when do you validate the configuration of it? Okay, it's, uh, Terraform has a validate comment. <laughs> so basically it will tell you like every parser, you have a syntax here, you have a syntax there. Or would tell you also, uh, I don't know, the variable is not available and these kind of stuff, so it's there. Okay, and then uh, I assume you spent some time using Terraform and it really looks cool on the first side, but have you found any downsides to it so far? Um, I think I could more talk about uh, the pros of this because I'm really about the stage where I'm very excited about the tool. It has some drawbacks. One of them is is uh, changing very very fast. So, for example, um, a lot of the stuff in this book is outdated, and you shouldn't do this this way anymore. Uh, for example, there were environments. Now there are workspaces, and this is not the same as branching and all this crazy stuff. So. Uh, it's still like at the early age of being a production, um, a stable tool because it is production ready because it is using uh, the API of these providers. So it's not like you have a crappy thing, um, but there are not so many good opinions how to use the tool correctly. Uh, and one of the drawbacks I came across was uh, the dependency management because when I I, mm, I use that tool also for things that uh, it's not meant to be. For example, you can, you have a Postgres provider and you can create databases. So you create not the instance itself, but also say, okay, add me that user, add me that database. And that's where I locked me out from the server because it first dropped me the network and then it wanted to delete the user and I don't, I didn't have access to the server anymore. And then you have to write dependencies on your own, and every time you reference a dependency, you have to <laughs> mention it uh, across the config, so it, it is kind of um, hard to figure that out. Um, yeah, so I think this this two things, so first the best practices, and then that not everything is um, documented. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions? Come on. I'm wondering, well, sorry, uh, how Terraform handle credentials for different providers? Yeah, uh, as you can see on my slides, I haven't used any passwords and still it was able to build me. Uh, so it used environment variables where you can set defaults. And for example, it is also using, uh, I, I was previously using the AWS CLI tool, the official one, and it stores your credentials in a specific place and Terraform will search for that. And if not, then they will search for environment variables. And in no, if not, they will search in code. And then you can have variables within the code itself. But uh, when you're using credentials, like you create a database and paste the credentials in there, it has to store them in plain text. So be aware that not everybody in the company can have access to the um, state code that you are using. But uh, I will um, add here that you, the state file, which knows about the resources available, don't have to be in the same place as the code. Like it, it has to be with git ignore and stored, for example, at an Amazon basket or something. Okay, last question, I think. Can you throw it back there? <laughs> Thank you. So loud. Uh, does Terraform has a post instance uh, creation scripts to? Yeah, know? yeah, it has. It is uh, called lifecycle. Uh, for example, with um, AWS instances, you want to um, boot that instance and then do something. For example, uh, create. Install, yeah. Yeah, or chef or something. So we have provisioners in lifecycle and you can decide should they fire on creation, on destroy and for, uh, on this kind of stuff. I've used them, for example, at Rabbit's uh, MQ. So I'm just uh, creating three instances and on boot they will just connect with each other. And on destroy they will disconnect gracefully. So you don't lose tra traffic. They first um, put them into an uh, unavailable state at load balancer, then destroy themselves from the cluster and then take the instance down. So it's very cool. and. It works like a charm. Okay, um, the slides uh, are already available at JointIn, and this uh, there is a link to speaker deck. Uh, I encourage you to rate my talk, to give me feedback, and if you have any questions, let's uh, also do them uh, here or find me on Twitter. Thank you.